Well, it's great to see everybody back out today. The weather cooperated, the county is here, our keynote is here. We're only waiting on one panelist who's walking in now, but uh, he's David's client, so he calls the shots anyway. Uh, I'll have some comments on the substance of tonight's program in a little bit. I just want to lead off the program by giving a great big thanks to our, our many sponsors. And Dean, if we can get the sponsorship slide up. Wells Fargo Bank, Turner Construction, the Building and Realty Institute, Cone Resnick Accounting and Consulting, Cuddy and Fetter Law Firm, H2M Architects and Engineers, Rand Commercial Real Estate, Simone Development Companies, Buzz Creator PR and Marketing, Zarin and Steinmetz Law Firm, and The Catalyst, that's the county's Office of Economic Development. I also want to recognize some folks in the audience, our chairperson Susan Fox, the, White, the president uh, of White Plains Hospital, will be here in a little bit. Uh, some of my counterparts, like Tim Foley at the BRI, and Janiac at the Westchester Municipal Officials Association. John Cooney is here from the Construction Industry Council. And a number of local elected officials and members of their staff. Among, among them, uh, the Deputy County Executive will be showing up, Ken Jenkins, Nikki Armacost from Hastings, Peter Schur from Pleasantville, Carl Fulgenzi from Mount Pleasant, Fred Ciliano from my town of Harrison, and a few county legislators, Nancy Barr and Catherine Parker. Now I'd like to welcome our county executive, George Latimer, to the, uh, to the microphone. Thank you very much, Mike. It's a pleasure to be with you all here today. And, and we look forward to the panel that's ahead uh, to talk about some of the issues that, that affect us in real estate. And uh, the, the us in real estate is really everybody who lives in Westchester County. The real estate industry, both commercial, residential, the whole uh, panoply of it, is critical to our economic development and also to the social structure of what makes Westchester what it is. Uh, I do want to just reinforce that I'm joined by some other members of our team. Bridget Gibbons is here, our Director of Economic Development. Bridget, give a wave. There, there she is, right down in front. Also, Leah Reyes, uh, Leah Reyes, who's our, Lisa Reyes, who is our uh, Communications Manager, is with us. Lisa? And I just want to reinforce, because every executive lives and dies by their legislature, uh, Nancy Barr is here, Vice Chair of the Board of Legislators. And we'll be joined, I gather, by Catherine Parker very shortly. Um, very simply, the importance of, of Westchester uh, is summarized in that phrase that I remember hearing when I was involved in the hotel industry about location, location, and location. And I've often told the story, and you're going to hear it again, about how my blue-collar father explained to me why he moved after World War II from Brooklyn to Westchester County. He came up from Brooklyn. My mom grew up uh, here in, in Harrison. And they met working in Mamaroneck. And uh, uh, the rest is uh, the story of how I got here. But <clears throat> I asked my dad why he moved up from Brooklyn. And of course, you know, living in the city is pretty, pretty cool. What makes you come out to Westchester County? I asked him the question. I was about 12 years old. And he looked at me the way that Dirty Harry looked at his superior officer uh, in, the, in the Dirty Harry movies, like, what are you asking me a stupid question for? And he said, two reasons. Number one, it's near New York City. Number two, it's not New York City. That's basically the uh, economic development plan for Westchester County. We're near New York City, and we're not New York City. We have a fabulous quality of life. We have a beautiful piece of land. It stretches from Nicky Armacost and Hastings on the Hudson River. Uh, over to the Long Island Sound Shore, where a number of us live, myself and others. And uh, in between, there are beautiful reservoir lakes in the middle of the county. It is a physically attractive county. It, it is uh, the reason why major U.S. corporations left Lower Manhattan or elsewhere, Midtown Manhattan, to come here in the 60s and 70s. And it's why when people are transferred in from other parts of the globe to work for corporations, either in New York or in White Plains or Stamford, that they decide they want to live in this county. And when they live here and they participate in the life of this county, they contribute to the not-for-profit organizations of this county. All of that is what contributes to this economic development we have. And it all begins with real estate. What also happens is we sometimes look at issues that may seem like they are matters of social justice, when in fact they are social justice and economic development at the same time. When we look at the issue of affordable housing, it is a responsible thing to try to keep people in an area 
with uh, a high market value and a high market rate to live here, but to keep some of those people here for a variety of reasons, the work that they do and the essential nature of the work that they do. And uh, so we want to try to develop affordable housing. And I have with us here our Deputy Commissioner of Planning, Blanca Lopez, who's going to be part of the, uh, of the panel in a few minutes. And Blanca has been with us in our Executive Chamber as, exe as Assistant Director of Operations, and she knows very well what this challenge is. Kevin Plunkett, the former Deputy County Executive, who's now a Senior Executive with Simone Development, knows exactly what it's like on both the government side and on the private sector side, and that those two things have to mesh together, because if we don't have affordable housing, we don't retain our businesses in Westchester County. We don't attract new businesses to Westchester County. And the same could be true of child care. Child care, again, social issue, social justice issue, to try to provide child care so that uh, mothers, fathers both can work and know that their children are taken well care of. But those people aren't out in the workforce if they don't have adequate child care. So it is both uh, a social justice need and also an economic development need. And that is in the most practical way that a business looks at their interests. If we are going to uh, function successfully in an area, a lot of things have to work to that end. And that is exactly what we hope to do in Westchester County. And not the government of Westchester County, but the community of Westchester. And that community involves government and business and not-for-profits and religious institutions and individuals all together understanding that our future is tied into it with each other. There's a lot of division in this country. We see it, we experience it, uh, and it is one part of having a small d democratic society. But to the extent that that division stops us from having common purpose, it then it makes us weaker. Here in Westchester, we try to avoid that. We have our disagreements, we have our differences. But at the end of the day, the future of Westchester is a common future of all of us. It's not just those of us in public office or even those of us in business. And those in the real estate industry see that on the firing lines because the demand to be in this county is still very much there. We have to figure out how to accommodate it effectively so that we can have that future, all of us together. With that, thank you for allowing me to share a few words. Thank you for all the good work you do and your team in Westchester County Association, Michael. We intend to continue to be good partners. Thank you very much. George, the, uh, the Dirty Harry quote that I remember was, go ahead, make my day. <laughs> and Dean, make my day by flipping the slide to the next one. So look, herein lies the problem. When people can't afford to live where they work, they look for work elsewhere. Jobs go unfilled, talent leaves the area, the economy stagnates, and taxes rise. This is an issue in Westchester. A lack of adequate housing is bad for our economy, our businesses, and our community. As an organization, the WC has identified housing as one of the primary pillars of advancing the regional economy, and we've been working on the issue for years. In addition to information and educational sessions, we also created the Policy Playbook, which is essentially a best practices guide and how-to manual for local governments interested in smart growth development. And I'll give a nod to my predecessor, Bill Mooney, who was uh, one of the brainchild, uh, uh, the, the brain trusts behind the policy playbook. Um, but without s the state stepping in with high level land use reform, we're not gonna get to where we need to be. Financial and technical assistance is great, don't get me wrong, and the county has stepped up with some historic uh, funding for affordable housing, so has the state. But that can only take you so far and it's not far enough because you can't deploy capital if you can't get projects approved at the local level. And at the local level, the kind of political and financial incentives, the pressures that exist that drive decisions, are too often in opposite to solving these problems. Fear of overtaxed services, crowded schools, pressure from neighborhood groups. Issues like these are tailor-made for state intervention. Dean, next slide, please. So what can we do about it? Well, we can follow the lead of essentially every other state like ours, coastal states with housing problems and strong economies, who are, and these, these states are increasingly stepping up to the challenge. So these are what we advocate for, a reasonable right of appeal, not just an Article 78 proceeding challenging the discretionary decisions of our local decision makers. 
Local decision makers can show accountability by putting forth a fact-based rationale for denying good projects. Now I know that municipal home rule is one of the third rails, but there are compromises to be had, things like safe harbors. So where local, uh, you know, local decision makers, towns and villages are working towards solving the problems, there are carve-outs, a shot clock on Secra. To something to get approved, you have to run a gauntlet of local approvals. It sometimes takes years and incredibly, incredible amounts of sunk costs, sometimes in the seven figures and up, and that's even before whether you know you can go forward with the project. And you can provide the right kinds of financial incentives. One of the problems at a place like Westchester is we have a lot of very well-heeled communities where dangling some money in front of them to do some planning or um, you know, come up with master plans just isn't gonna be an incentive that they're interested in. But school-based incentives are a different story. These are some of the things we're gonna talk about today. Now I'd like to introduce our keynote, Dr. Denny, Jenny Schutz, who is a senior fellow at Brookings Metro in Washington, DC, and an expert in ur urban economics and housing policy. She has written and lectured extensively on housing and has just published Fixer Upper. This is my well-worn copy. I've read it cover to cover. It's got solutions on how to repair America's broken housing systems. She has studied New York as a test case in the context of other states that are moving forward. Jenny holds a bachelor's degree from economics and from the University of Virginia, a master's in city planning from MIT, and a PhD in public policy from Harvard. Look, we try and get some intellectual firepower for these events, and sometimes we fall short. <laughs> um, where I went to college, we would call folks like Jenny wicked smart. <laughs> Jenny, welcome and thank you for addressing our audience today. Where I went to school, they also call people like Michael wicked smart, so. Uh, thanks very much for giving me a chance to be here today and to talk with you. Uh, you, you. Our first two speakers have teed up a bunch of the issues. I wanna focus a little bit more both on kind of the policy side, what state governments can be doing, um, and then hopefully tee up the panel to follow, which is talking about the politics. How do we actually get some of these policies enacted? So the, biggest, the big picture context, not just for Westchester, but for the country overall, is that for about a decade now, we just haven't been building enough homes to keep up with the demand created by population growth and job growth. Uh, so this is showing you housing starts uh, going back to the, um, going back to about 1970, and you can see this sort of jumps up and down over time, but is trending downwards. You can see the giant cliff that's the Great Recession. We just stopped building homes for about five years. We went almost to zero. And although it's been picking up, we've never gotten back to the level that we were before, right? So nationally, we're at at least a 10-year deficit of building enough homes to keep up with the demands of population growth. Now, that's actually much more acute if we focus on places like the New York region, Boston, California, places that have the strongest job markets, communities like Westchester County, which as you heard, has fantastic amenities, great transit, great schools, great neighborhoods that people wanna live in. Those communities haven't been building enough homes for about 30 years. Now, why is, that, why is this coming to the fore now? Places that haven't been building enough homes, you see prices go up faster than incomes, we're starting to see a real pushback by state governments across the country, realizing that regions now are hurting and that state governments have an important role to play in this. So this is the smattering of headlines from a couple of the states, not all of them, that have been talking about state-level policy changes. Um, some places like Oregon and Massachusetts have passed some fairly ambitious reforms in the last couple of years, and in the process of testing them out to see what works, um, Maine, just a couple of weeks ago, joined on the bandwagon. New York has made some tentative steps in this direction, um, and I suspect we'll continue to do this. Um, as we'll, we can talk about later, one of the things that we've learned from the states that pass statewide zoning reform is that this is usually not a one-year process. Something gets introduced, doesn't quite make it, the next year it gets introduced with some tweaks on the policy side to bring more people on board to the political coalition, and I'll be curious to see what happens in the next round of the legislature here. 
States are leaning in uh, to what has traditionally been very much a local government issue. Um, New York, like Massachusetts, like California, is a strong home rule state. Uh, so local governments are used to having authority over the production of housing, essentially regulating what gets built, what doesn't, and where. But we've, what we've found out is that at the regional level, for the New York metro area, for greater Boston, there's some real downsides to individual localities not allowing enough housing to be built. Um, so we know, for instance, that people don't work and solely within the place where they live, that people cross over political boundaries. People who live in Westchester work in New York City, work in Connecticut, and vice versa, right? So the region overall needs to be building enough homes, not just for your executives, not just for your software engineers, but for your housekeepers, for your baristas, for your retail workers. The regional economy needs enough housing at a range of different price and rent points to accommodate workers who are earning different kinds of salaries just for the labor markets to work. Westchester County is one of the places that people would love to live in order to send their kids to your great public schools. That is the access to opportunity for, particularly for low and moderate income households, sending their kids to good public schools so that they develop skills and can become productive workers. But when housing isn't affordable for lower income workers, families get shut out of the chance to build their human capital. Uh, Westchester is also certainly familiar with some issues of racial segregation. When the most affluent communities, which tend to be pretty white, don't build enough housing, black and Latino families have a hard time getting access to those great public schools. Um, we also know that it, when the region builds most of its housing out on the outskirts, away from your fantastic tr public transportation system, more people are driving longer distances, creating more greenhouse gas emissions, and all of us are breathing more polluted air because we're not building enough housing on top of the transit system that we already have. Right? These impacts don't get felt just at the local level. They get felt by all of the communities in the region, and they rebound on the state-level economy, which is why state governments are saying, wait a minute, we're not going to give local governments complete autonomy over housing production and land use regulation if they abuse it, if they don't use this to reach better outcomes for the entire state and for citizens. One of, the, uh, one of the areas of regulation that's drawn a lot of attention is the focus on single-family exclusive zoning. So in most of the US, including in large cities, in Washington DC where I live, in Los Angeles, in large parts even of New York City, zoning rules prohibit anything other than a single-family detached house from being built. Everything else is illegal. Can't build a townhouse, can't build a duplex, only single-family detached homes, right? Those take up the most amount of land. It's the most expensive type of housing. And we have locked in a lot of very valuable land into this really low density form that was built 50 years ago. Because you can't change it, you literally cannot add any additional housing. All you can do is replace a small single family home with a bigger and more expensive one, right? That's not helping our affordability problem. It's not just one regulation. It's not just single family exclusive zoning. It's requiring two acres of land for every single family home, which many of the Westchester and Connecticut suburbs do, right? Two acres of land becomes a very expensive house in a hurry, right? Things like historic preservation make it very hard to tear down what's there or to alter it, to add anything. All of these rules and regulations have frozen many of our high demand communities in amber and made them inflexible to labor markets and to, to pressures to build more housing. It's also not just about the rules that are written on paper. This is very much about the process for approving what gets built and what doesn't. Local governments have the primary authority to approve housing. They have chosen to outsource a lot of that authority to people who already live in communities. Completely understandable that people care about what happens in their neighborhood. Building more homes does, yes, mean more people live in your neighborhood. Potentially more cars, potentially more kids going to your school. So it's understandable that current residents want to have a voice, but when we give them a veto power over development that they want, which often is all development, that has serious economic, social, and environmental costs for everybody in the region and for the entire country, as a matter of fact. This is a picture uh, of a sign that's been popular in the Boston suburbs, stop the Weston Whopper, um, but I'm sure that if I drove around Westchester, I would see similar pictures, um, that proposals to build anything over about two stories with more than three or four housing units becomes a boogeyman, and people are claiming that this is gonna be the end of civilization as we know it. <laughs> You're not unique. 
Local governments themselves play a role in the pushback against new housing, and particularly smaller, moderately priced housing. This goes back to the way we pay for those wonderful public schools, our roads, our park systems. Local governments rely very heavily on property taxes, collected on residences and on businesses, to pay for all of these public services. So county executives, city council members do this calculus in their head, if I allow a new apartment building to be built, how many kids are gonna move in that need to go to school? Do I have to build another building and hire more teachers? How much property tax revenue is this gonna generate? Does the project pencil out in terms of the public finances of the local government? And many local governments have decided that by only permitting very large expensive homes, they can cover their bottom line. So again, understand where that's coming from, but if every local government does this and only wants to build housing for wealthy people, where does everybody else live, right? Again, this is a reason why moving things upstairs to the state level could help because there's some practical responses. Bringing more kids into your community cause, costs more money, they need to go to school, the state can help out with that, right? To the extent that there are practical fiscal concerns for local governments, having a conversation about how to mitigate that can make it easier for local governments to say yes to the housing they know they need to build. So the, the paper that I wrote, which you can read if you really want to get into the wonky details, um, suggests that states should focus on four overarching goals. The first one, particularly for states like New York that don't have a state-level housing policy, is just to figure out what you need to do, right? Do an assessment of the needs and conditions. This is a very big and very diverse state. Some communities have strong demand and aren't building enough housing. There are other communities that have lost population for 50 years and have more homes than they have people, right? So the needs are gonna be different across the state and getting a good handle on that is the first step. In places like Westchester County, the emphasis is gonna be on how do you encourage more housing production in places that have strong demand but aren't building enough housing. That, of course, is gonna be politically the trickiest area. Um, third, provide financial support to low-income households. This is actually something that most states do already through various forms, but again, there are different ways that you can do this, and some of this are more efficient or fit better with local context than others. Um, and we need to talk about climate every time we talk about housing. Where we're building housing and where we're not building housing is one of the biggest drivers of climate change. Also, in places like New York, you have some issues with sea level rise and some coastal storms. Thinking about where housing is built and the risks, and particularly whether you continue to build and rebuild homes in places that are gonna be at a high and higher risk over time should be part of the consideration. So I'll give you just a little bit of a snapshot of some data here to put Westchester in context. So this is showing you on the horizontal axis the growth in housing stock, how much got built over the 10-year period from 2009 to 2019. And on the vertical axis, this is the median housing value. So what we can see is that in general, places that are building more are higher value places, right? So this is the sign of a healthy market, right? Places where people want to live uh, are expanding their housing supply. Those are the places that are expensive because they're nice places to live. Now, we can see here, uh, Westchester looks like a bargain compared to Manhattan and Brooklyn, um, not so much to the rest of the state. So you guys know this, that you're fairly expensive up there with Nassau. So there's a cluster of communities where more people would like to live if they could afford to. Um, and you can see also that there's a, there's a big variation in housing costs across the state. So this is gonna be something that the state needs to finesse it to local demand. So the really critical question is, how do states convince local governments to allow more housing in places where the market is very strong? Um, there isn't just one form of that works. Um, this is an area that's pretty new to a lot of state governments. They're experimenting with a bunch of things. We're still learning from places that have tried things already. Um, some sort of a financial carrot and stick uh, is some, what most economists would recommend. Uh, set some targets. You need to build X number of units or increase your housing supply by 2% over the next 10 years, but you figure out how to do this, right? Providing some local flexibility to figure out how to meet it, but with clear targets and with either some carrots, if you build more uh, housing for families with kids, we'll give you more money for schools, or sticks, we'll take away some of your road funding and your park funding if you don't. Um, but having some incentives tied to this to actually make it stick. Um, the second one, oversight of local land use planning, is something that some states have done for a long time. That's a hard one to impose on states that have a very strong home rule tradition um, and probably not likely to do. 
Um, builder's remedy is something that New York could certainly think about, either the form that Massachusetts has or something more like New Jersey, where essentially developers are allowed to build housing that doesn't conform with existing zoning if it meets some specific goals. So typically for something like below, moderate, uh, below, in, uh, below market rate units for low income households, right? It's a way to get housing built that meets a social need. Um, and then the last one is sort of the more popular uh, technique at the moment for the state to preempt specific zoning rules. Um, localities aren't permitted, for instance, to prohibit accessory dwelling units or duplexes, right? So legalizing that statewide by taking away that ability from local governments. So all of these are possibilities. Um, I, I will say that it matters a little bit less which of these strategies gets picked than how the policy is designed and implemented, whether there are teeth, um, and also I think whether the policy is designed in consultation so that local governments buy into this and are actually willing to carry this out, right? So the state passing a law which then gets tied up in litigation doesn't really do that much, um, and bringing along some support in advance is often helpful. Um, I picked out just three of the states that are doing something that have really different approaches. Um, I, I will say that Oregon in some ways has one of the better platforms. The state has had an oversight rule in local land use since the 1970s, very much oriented towards conservation of open space, forests and farmland. Um, it's a unique role that I think is not that easy to copy, but one of the sort of uh, guiding principles is limit development in undeveloped areas, the places that you really want to keep pristine, that have environmentally sensitive land, concentrate the development in areas that are already have infrastructure, where people want to live, um, and you know, really concentrate on, on density and infill areas. Um, and that's certainly an approach that could work well in places like Westchester. California, I always hold up as the cautionary tale. Um, New York is expensive, but it's not California yet. The more expensive housing gets, the more toxic the politics becomes. So I think it's a good idea to get out in front of this problem before it gets worse, because it is harder and harder to have rational conversation. California has been fighting over this for at least 30 years, and the fights get nastier every year. Um, so you guys are wise to start before it gets that bad. Massachusetts is also a good example. In particular, what they're focusing on now is very much around transit-oriented development. So identify the commuter rail stations, the subway lines where you can build additional housing. That's great for climate. Those are places that have a lot of infrastructure already. And that's certainly something that could work not only in Westchester, but in a lot of the New York suburbs. None of the ideas in my book, I'm sorry to tell you, Michael, are original ideas. <laughs> Most of the suggestions uh, that I'm putting forward and the, the ideas that I've suggested to you today, these have been floating around for a long time, right? We have lots of great policy ideas. The problem is that the politics are just wicked hot and there's no way around it. Um, if you've been following the news coming out of Berkeley, uh, you'll know that California has reached a new low in housing politics. A handful of long-term homeowners um, have essentially sued under the state's Environmental Quality Act to prevent the University of California at Berkeley from expanding the number of students they're admitting to their freshman class, right? UC Berkeley, such an engine of growth, such a way to access opportunity for lots of first-generation kids. So many Nobel Prizes coming out of UC Berkeley, we should want more people to go there and to add to the store of knowledge. A handful of homeowners who've been living in Berkeley since they moved there as graduate students in the 1970s don't want the town to build more student housing. And because there isn't enough student housing, they don't want the university to admit more students, right? So there's a catch-22. Um, and they are tied up in litigation. The, the city and the state both would like to build more student housing and expand UC Berkeley. And a handful of homeowners have basically shut this down, right? That seems like not a great balance of power for a progressive state and for a community that wants to expand opportunity. Um, if you want to get into all sorts of uh, further reasons, what's wrong with housing systems, how we can fix it, um, you're welcome to take a look at the book. Um, but I'm very much looking forward to the panel discussion and learning more about some of your local politics and ways that New York can move forward on this. Thank you. Jenny will take a couple of questions. She's also agreed to sit on the panel, so she's going to run David's gauntlet as well. But if anybody has any questions before the panel gets started, please raise your hand. Okay, thank you. Rent control and uh, rent stabilization, uh, which are you know prevalent in some of the uh, communities here in uh, New York State. How does that help? Uh, maybe some. 
reason why we're so behind in building um, housing is because some of the state laws uh, have disincentivized uh, builders from doing that with the fear of you know having their multifamily dwellings uh, turn into a rent control or rent stabilized situation. Yeah, so m my views on rent, uh, rent regulation, so not just hard rent control, but all of the forms of rent stabilization, it's a band-aid, it's not a solution, right? So there are two underlying problems with affordability. The first one is that graph with the uh, housing production falling off cliff. We, we don't build enough homes. And the second one is that the t poorest 20% of households everywhere in the country can't afford housing because their incomes are too low. So they just don't earn enough money to pay the operating cost on a modest apartment. Right? Rent control doesn't fix either of those two things. It definitely doesn't build more homes. Even if it's well done and doesn't impede construction, it doesn't build any more housing, right? That's not the point of it. It also doesn't address the problem of low incomes. Um, you know, rent control is one of the not well-targeted programs when we think about how to help poor people cover the cost of housing. There are non-poor people who live in rent-controlled units, and there are a lot of poor people who don't have access to rent-controlled units, in part because they don't turn over very often, right? Once you get a rent-controlled unit, you never move out of it. Um, so it's not my favorite way to help poor people. It's not particularly well-targeted. It's very politically popular with some mayors because it doesn't cost them money out of pocket um, and it gets them some political support. So the mayor of Boston, for instance, who was just elected, has been proposing reinstating rent control in Boston. You know, it, it's politically appealing in the short run, but it's not going to fix anything. You know, I will say that it's worth thinking about, even if we adopt zoning reforms and start building more housing, even if the federal government provides a lot more money for housing subsidy than it does, that's a medium to long run fix. And one of the appeals of rent control is that you can impose it right away and it goes into effect quickly. I could maybe be persuaded that a short term rent regulation while supply is picking up and while subsidies are expanding could help ease the transition, but it needs to be done as a timed program that's gonna go out. Any more questions for Jenny before we start the panel? Oh, you have a follow-up? Yes, okay. yes. Well, I have one comment. I wish you could record what you just said and send it to some of the state legislatures here in New York. <laughs> That's number one. Number two, what about Section 8 uh, and HUD? Um, is there any um, movement or any uh, reason why the government doesn't uh, put more emphasis on issuing more Section 8 vouchers um, I know that in Yonkers alone, the Municipal Housing um, Authority in Yonkers has a, a waiting list of 7,000 people and they are no, uh, not accepting any more vouchers. Section 8 is a program that works very, very well and it helps to at least get the basic needs of some of the people that we're looking to uh, help and looking to keep in our neighborhoods so that we can get the essential work that needs to be done, not just at the brain surgery level, but at the childcare level and, and uh, you know, at the uh, busboy level and things like that. Yeah, I mean, the, the single best thing that the federal government could do to help poor families is either expand the number of vouchers, make an entitlement so every poor family gets one, or to just give people cash, right? So the child tax credit was actually a fantastic program, helped a lot of low-income families with kids pay the rent, buy food. So giving people vouchers or cash would be fantastic. The reason that they don't do it is that Congress has chosen not to assign more budget for it, right? So housing subsidies are one of the few programs to help low-income families that's not an entitlement. Most low-income families don't qualify compared to something like Medicaid or food stamps where it's automatic. If you're poor enough, you get uh, access to it. So I, I would love to see more money assigned for that. The Biden administration did have a substantial expansion of vouchers in, in Build Back Better. Um, that hasn't made it through. We'll see if more money gets attached to that, but I'd, I'd love to see the federal government spend more money on helping poor people pay their rent. All right, before I call the panel up, I actually have a question, and I want to recognize that the county actually has a model affordable housing ordinance. Not all of the municipalities, towns, and villages in Westchester have adopted them. I will not name names. You know who you are. On the other side of the ledger, some towns try and solve the problem by just pushing the problem down to the developers. Instead of a 10% affordable housing requirement, 
a 20% affordable housing requirement. Why not just do that? There is a limit to how much you can make developers swallow the cost of subsidizing housing before they choose not to build or pick up and move someplace else. So developers always have the option just not to build or to build in a different location. You know, in places where the rents are very high, developers often can set aside some units at below market rate and do essentially an internal cross subsidy to pay for that. And developers are often willing to do that if they get, say, an, a density bonus. You can build more units, you can build taller, but some of the units are gonna be set aside for low income. The city of San Diego actually has a, a voluntary program now where developers automatically get a density bonus of 30 to 50% if they set aside some units for low-income households, and they've built a substantial amount of new housing, and developers are opting into this because it works for them. But if you force developers to build a 50% set-aside, an 80% set-aside, it kills the project, and you get no units at all. No affordable units, no market rate units, and that doesn't help. For the record, that wasn't rehearsed. Um, <laughs> we're trying to poke the bear today. I think the best way to get solutions is spirited debate, not another webinar where everybody is just nodding in agreement, and those are ridiculous, come on. So um, I'm gonna call the panel up now, and I'll introduce our moderator, David Steinmetz, and then the rest of the panel can introduce themselves, and Jenny's gonna agree to stick around and sit on the panel as well. David is a founding member and managing partner of the law firm of Zarin and Steinmetz, a regional law firm specializing in real estate, land use, environmental law, and regulation litigation. He represents numerous major developers, as well as nonprofits, municipalities, and institutions. He's received numerous pro professional accolades, including being named as a super lawyer, something that I was never named when I was in practice. I think he has a cape and a funny hat for that, but he's been a super lawyer every year for the last seven years, and has also been named one of Westchester's top 25 lawyers. The rest of the panel has been selected to give a variety of perspectives. We're fortunate to have this kind of experience and expertise with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. I'm sitting here struggling. As a frontline land use practitioner, would I rather take Michael Ramita or Dr. Jenny Schutz to every one of my community meetings uh, to provide a little extra support? But good afternoon, everybody. We have a really good group of folks out there. We have a lot of government officials, developers, an awful lot of frontline land use practitioners. I'm excited um, for this because I think this is really uh, rather critical and a rather timely issue. Uh, some have said and have written that the housing crisis is the, quote, ticking time bomb at the fulcrum of the American economy. And I, I think uh, Dr. Schutz brought a lot of that to light. Is it true? Can we solve it? Can we solve it as a community? Or at a minimum, can we at least begin to address the issues? Those are the kinds of issues and questions that I'm gonna to try to push the panel on. And as Michael said, um, I'm hoping that we have some good discussion and, and actually some very good debate. Um, Dr. Schutz set the table extremely well for the discussion and I, and I wanna set the table now for this panel. Blanca Lopez, um, Deputy Planning Commissioner here in our county. Uh, she serves as the liaison to the county planning department for our county, for our county executive. Blanca is uniquely positioned today to provide all of us with perspectives of the county, the county planning department, substantively and politically. And we've already heard some allusion to some of the political issues that are, that are in front of us. Pat Cleary, I'm sure most of you in, in, in the room know Pat, one of the most experienced municipal uh, planning consultants that we have in the county. Pat has to deal with all of us and all of our clients who are in the review process, going through these projects, numerous communities, each with its own unique and disparate views and goals and objectives. The interesting thing about Pat to me, Pat sits in Republican towns and villages, Democratic towns and villages, large ones, small ones. So Pat really does see the land use process and the housing crisis from a number of different vantage points. The other thing that's interesting about Pat is for those of us who know him, we wonder if he has a clone because there is no way he can be in all the places he's supposed to be at the same time, and he's like one guy. So um, I, I don't know how he does that. Jonathan Gertman. Um, 
Jonathan is a skilled developer with NRP. Uh, he has successfully and is successfully building both market rate and affordable housing throughout um, our community and in the region. Disclosure, and Michael alluded to it, Jonathan and NRP are clients of our firm. Um, full disclosure, Jonathan and I don't get along, and it's not just because he was late and Michael was getting pissed at me, but Jonathan and I have had some recent success together um, on an affordable housing project up county, and I think it's now making him look bad on all of his other projects that aren't moving as smoothly. Um, so let's get to it. There are documented problems with housing supply. Dr. Schutz laid out the data. Statistically, fewer homes are being built. Fewer homes are turning over because there's no good options for aging seniors to go to. So how do we create opportunities for seniors, active adults, and others who don't necessarily need assisted living, independent living, and that specific type of housing? And where there is supply of housing in our county, low-cost housing usually can't be found. So we're going to try to figure out and ferret out what policies are working, what policies are not working, and how do we truly incentivize affordable, even low-cost housing? Is it federal, county, and state subsidies? Or, as some have said, do we try to reduce or circumscribe local regu regulations that control the process? Why can Jonathan Gertman actually build affordable housing in some places, and I have other clients who, who simply can't do it. They're, they're unable to generate that product. And what is the right way to build affordable housing? Is it in accordance with the county guidelines at 80% of the size of all the other units? Is it interspersed throughout the entire development, or is there something else? So before we go to the questions, I want to start with some very simple threshold questions for the room, and I'm going to ask for everybody's cooperation with a simple show of hands. How many in this room rent currently? How many own? I won't ask whether there are people that are living with their parents or their children, so you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> How many of you have been in your place of residence for 20 years or more? Surprising, good number. How many 10 years or more? How many people in this room are in some kind of age-restricted or regulated homeowners association type community? Nobody, very few, maybe one hand in the back there. Maybe the most important question of all, how many of you live in a neighborhood or in a subdivision where there is an affordable housing component that was provided by the local government, mandated by the local government? How many in this room can say in my 65 unit subdivision or lot subdivision, there are seven affordable housing units in my subdivision. Not a hand up in the room. Okay, so that tells us, I think right there is a little bit of some baseline empirical data about the lack of affordable housing that we're all exposed to on a regular basis. I'm actually gonna start with Dr. Schutz with my, I'm gonna follow up Michael's last question. He's right, there are places in our county and we all know it, 10% affordable housing, 12% affordable housing. Some flirt with the 20% affordable housing. And developers are not asked or not offered bonuses to get to those units. At what point, Dr. Schutz, does that become, in your opinion, a confiscatory taking? And how close to the edge are we flirting if we ask, if we ask the development community to generate affordable housing, but we don't provide something? I mean, the, the answer to that is it's going to depend. It varies across places. Um, so the District of Columbia, where I live, has mandatory inclusionary zoning uh, that gets triggered essentially for all rezonings. And so there's already, the developer can't get permission to build anything unless they go through this process, and then there's negotiation over it. And some of the projects wind up with 15%. Some of them wind up with maybe 7 or 8% because it depends on the value of the land, it depends on the rents that they're planning to get and the size of the project. So this is an area where you, know, you, can, you can push developers a little bit more in some places. You know when you've gone too far because they walk away, the deal doesn't happen. I will say that if you're gonna have an inclusionary zoning, a mandatory inclusionary zoning, 
even though it's tempting to try to ask the developer for as much as possible to do this negotiation on a case-by-case -case basis, that that's actually a bad way to structure the policy because it costs more money, right? The negotiation itself is expensive. It takes time. It's uncertain, right? If you can get a 10% policy and a 10% deal works for most of the projects, just do that. Make it straightforward, make it simple, make it easy, and you know, get 10% of the units and keep going. If that's not gonna work, right, if you're gonna have to negotiate every single one of them, think about whether there is some sort of a give that can go along with it. In most places throughout the country, are you seeing bonuses as opposed to subsidies that are coming from some governmental agency? Yeah, inclusionary zoning rarely comes with a subsidy. New York City is one of the exceptions to that because they have to do that to make it work. But in most places, um, either it's a requirement to build anything and developers who really want to build in that location are willing to go through it, although increasingly not. Streamlining permits process, fast tracking, uh, reduced parking, uh, which often works really nicely, or density bonus. So Blanca, what can the county do through two thir GML 239M or some other mechanism to help create that perspective among our communities about providing bonuses. It's wonderful when we see the 239M letters come out of the county planning department, but we're not seeing, we're not seeing anything where bonuses are being advocated. How do we deal with that? Well, we do use and we, um use every opportunity to remind our municipalities, our 46 municipalities, about uh, the need to build um, housing in general, but also a focus on affordable housing, because we're simply not building housing that meets the ability for people to be able to pay and afford. Um, the referral process, as everybody knows, you know, usually when a municipality is going to have a development that's within 500 feet of a county property or another municipality, uh, they will submit their information to the planning board, and in return, we will provide, uh, on behalf of the planning board, guidance and information with respect to the development they want to do. Most of the time, we include the fact that they need to think about affordable housing, they need to think about inclusionary zoning practices, but. It's not often, and it's not in every development that we receive that type of information, correct? Um, but we try to do, though, is to track the different types of affordable housing that is being built. Uh, we keep track in every municipality in terms of what uh, inclusionary zoning they have, whether it's 10, 20, whether they have a um, payment in lieu. So instead of building the affordable housing unit, they will pay into a fund, and the municipality will then hopefully use that fund to support or build affordable housing in another way. Um, but what we have been doing, um, and, and I think going back to 2018 and then the, the uh, publishing the housing needs assessment, which was in 2019, we knew that the affordable housing need for the county was going to be 11,703 units. Now, it's now 2022. So obviously that amount has increased, um, but we keep track of the number of units that are being built. Uh, we also provide funding either for acquisition or for infrastructure for municipalities that are building affordable housing units. And our IDA also plays a role in developing affordable housing units. Um, I many times read their meeting minutes and I know that our IDA representatives are always looking or are always asking questions with respect to how many affordable housing units are coming out of this particular proposal in order to see whether or not uh, benefits will be given. Um, we track this because we know we want to encourage and meet that 11,000 goal countywide and we use every opportunity available to talk to our municipalities, those that are open to uh, reviewing their own uh, zoning uh, codes or, or um, with respect to including more inclusionary zoning or those that perhaps have kind of stayed away from building affordable housing but now they know that there's a regional need and they're, the fact that they're not building enough is causing so, a so strain. Let me, so let me stop you there and you yeah. all can feel free to yeah. jump in with one another if you wish but Pat, how can Blanca and the planning department help you in your local municipalities, maybe more than they are now? So that's a great <clears throat> question, David. So um, every 239 letter comes to every community for every project, mm -hmm. and it's affordable housing and bike racks and some green infrastructure. A lot of times that doesn't resonate 
it doesn't sort of hit to get to the heart of what the issue really is. Frankly, the issue isn't that we need to hit a target. It's, it's, the, it's the fact that we are dealing with affordable housing in silos. It's such a complex issue. Because it's a complex issue, we default to simplistic re, um, responses, adopt a model ordinance. There's a number of 750 that's out there. 750 is 11,000. 750 is nowhere close to what we need to achieve. But that was a number that many communities thought about in adopting a model ordinance. The issue is so complex, we have to address this in a multi-fronted attack. It has to address an integrated web of issues that we deal with on the local level. What the county can do is we have weak regional planning in New York. That's an unfortunate situation. Our friends in the county are the best asset we have, and they should be pushing us. They should be pushing us to do better, to integrate our land use strategies across a broad spectrum of issues. So as Jenny indicated earlier, the provision of affordable housing in a hamlet is the preservation of open space and green environmental areas elsewhere in the community. All of a sudden, it's not, it's not affordable housing. It's environmental preservation. It's about just restoring our infrastructure and our transit networks. If we can look at this from all of those different angles, and the county can take a leadership role in helping us to develop that sort of approach to dealing with things, now we're being planners. That's our, it's at least my job, is to push communities to do things better. Um, and if we put affordable housing in a simple silo, we're losing, we're building one-legged stools. That's really what we're doing. So let's talk about pushing communities a little bit um, as a planner, which you know, Many of us on the front line as advocates push you to push your communities. Yeah. Or how do we get over the hurdle of the presumption of validity of legislative acts? Because you and I may agree that something should be done, but then the local government ignores your data. Yeah, well, it's, it's several things, David. So it's the local government per se, but the local government is influenced by Jenny's photograph of lawn signs, which is the people in the community picking up the phone and calling the supervisor and saying, we're not going to elect you if you say yes to that particular project. That's a pretty significant threat to an elected official. Um, I, you know, again, I don't, I don't know what the answer is to this, but I think if, if we... Um, All right, let's be candid about some of these things. So. No one tell anyone that he's about to say this. <laughs> no, no, no. no. Um, I think the default position is what's the right thing to do in our communities. So if we start with comprehensive planning, if we put policies in place that, the, that are the right things to do, we can come around the back door to achieve solutions to those things. There's a lot, as Jenny indicated, there's lots of ways to do this. There's many ways to skin the cat. Mm -hmm. But you need to have a, an approach that sort of says these are the good things for our community and the things we should do. Um, and I think once that's out there, our policy as articulated in a master plan, for example, it's, it's, we can uh, deal with it through the infrastructure approach or the transportation approach or the environmental protection approach. And then at the end of the day, we've, by the way, solved an affordable uh, 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 housing issue, which is really about housing diversity. That's really what we're trying to do. You know, the problem we have is zoning is is by its very nature, it, it segregates folks. It draws lines and puts people on one side of a line on the other side of a line. That theory was the second half of the 20th, 20th century's work product. It was a mistake, candidly. We're repairing that mistake now because we've come to our senses, but all of that is sort of, is dictated by we've gotta change the rules. We've gotta put policies in place that say this is the way to move things away from the way we used to do it because we did it wrong, candidly. So Jonathan, how David. important is it for you to have density in your project, to have government subsidies and, and, and benefits that I know you're able to receive from the state, and pilots. Explain to us the mix that goes into the pot to try to come out with something that's, that, that works. Sure. <clears throat> and it's, it's great to be up here, and my fear is just you're, the better you do, the worse I'm going to look, <laughs> as we were established <laughs> earlier, so we better get done fast. Um, I, I guess. That's really a, you can make that as complicated as you want to, and you, we can really Frankenstein up these projects if we want to. Um, and high taxes is the answer to a lot of those things. But I guess I'll just first differentiate between sort of like capital A affordable housing, which in my mind means tax credits, state subsidies, and all the benefits that flow down on a competitive basis, which is something that our company just does and is sort of a specific way of creating long-term um, income restricted housing. And then sort of lowercase a affordable, which I think of as inclusionary or just 
hey, you're creating enough supply to create a market dynamic where um, rents go down. Like 2020 in New York City, rents went down a lot. The demand dropped off, the supply was there. Hey, rents actually don't always go in one direction. That was a horrible circumstance, obviously, and now you see it going back up. But it was sort of proof that markets actually work um, under the right conditions. To, to get to your sort of, uh, I'm gonna answer a different question, which is, I mean, for me, the, the biggest thing that we look for is, is just certainty. Like, to get, tell me the rules of the road, right? And, and I, I- Certainty in terms of, of duration, of process, certainty? Process, what can we do? What is the, if we pass this series of fact and you know, data-based hurdles, Will we get to an end result? You don't, not, yes, I'm gonna, you're gonna be able to do your project up front, but there's a process, it's somewhat objective, there's a fair hearing, and then there's a roadmap. And developers, I think, you know, any developer, builder, we are problem solvers, we're professional problem solvers. Like, give us a roadmap or give us the rules and we'll figure out how to get to the finish line, and that's what we do. Um, you know, I'm in communities where I'm going through a zone change with Pat and, and sort of others that are here. And you know, there's, it's, it's that, I think the, the standard on us and on developers should be much higher and is much higher in that instance, but we're in a scenario that is factually and professionally being driven. And as we meet the burden of proof, we are you know, slowly but surely working through a, a you know, fair objective process. I'm in communities that have, where the, democratically elected officials, you know, the town boards, if you will, have gone through a public process, adopted a form-based code, which to the lay of person, to the, I think to the, to the voter, to the citizen, you think, okay, there's a process, the legislative body adopted this, it says very clearly you can build this, you can't build that, this is how you build this. Mm -hmm. If I'm a citizen on the street, I, I'm going to bed that night thinking, okay, there was a process, it was adopted, this is what's gonna happen in my town, and I've, planning board members then who are in open revolt against that adopted plan. So if, if you can't have a form-based code, you know, that's gone through CEQA, that's gone through an extensive process, uh, that, and, and not know, you know, that if you follow those rules, you're gonna be able to get to the end in a reasonable, and I'm, I'm speaking reasonable in Westchester time, uh, terms here, right? A year, 18 months, um, you know, I don't know how you're, ever going to get close to solving a problem or creating a dyna you know, dynamic communities that you want to have. So it sounds to me like you would agree with the comments that we heard earlier from, from Jenny and, and Michael about the standard of, of review and my yeah. question to Pat about the presumption of validity. You, you, you want to know that your, I assume you want to know that your empirical data is going to carry weight with someone and not just be an expenditure during the process. Yes, correct. Of course. Yes. And I'd like to know that the, you know, that there is some, that, in, in those instances, I'm talking about like that that the that the rule that that the rules that were set down are valid, are true. That you're not going to say, okay, I get it. I'm going to spend the money. I'm going to go through the negotiate the land contract, hire all the consultants, do the studies, you know, follow the rules of the road, get in, you know, pay the price of admission, if you will, and then you get there and say, actually. We were just kidding about that. It's, yeah. that's, there's, there actually are no rules here. And, and that's why, David, it's imperative we meet halfway. That's the critical piece to this. So the, the empirical data is what it is, and they'll impact the wetland or the floodplain, or they won't. At the end of the day, they'll mitigate it or they won't. The issue that has to occur is when we meet halfway, there has to be a policy that overrides that, that said this idea is a good idea. If it works, we should find a way to make it work. But there's a policy objective that, that sort of overrides everything. Seeker's a very interesting thing. It freaks people out. People are terrified about it. Yeah. People manipulate it. It's a, it's a challenge for everyone. But it can be a benefit as well. And there are communities in the county that have gone through, for example, the generic environmental impact statement process and put in place rules and thresholds by which when he steps up to the plate and says, I'd like to build something, Seeker has sort of said, you can, so long as it doesn't go past that line. What about the shot clock, Pat? You, you heard Michael raised it. We've, no. we've talked about it. Many of us have talked about it. Yeah. Um, we're fr you know, a lot of people out there are frustrated that this, the secret process takes as long and is as painful as it is. Your local government, you're representing local government. Yeah. Th that means developers like Jonathan are going to be climbing on you saying, you have, you have 30 days. You can't let this thing drag out yeah. for 90 to 120. 
you know, shot clock's a great idea, but you know, seeker is so um, misused from places, to, or inequitably used from place to place. In some places, um, uh, communities are very responsive to moving projects along. In other places, it's a delay tactic, and it's used you know, as an adversarial tool to submarine Jonathan's project. I, I think that the layers of discretionary review are there's there's just so many and for every phase there is a public comment period right so you see the same people coming out because they are in tune with what is going on with developments for some people this is a hobby oh I have to know which developments coming up so I can go in a pine right uh, your, your people actually look at what developments are coming <laughs> Wow <laughs> they're, they're right on that's a, that. that's a sophisticated pine. class of uh, <laughs> public commentator and unfortunately you know um, submit negative comments about why development is not a good thing sure, in the village, right? Um, but having that input from the public, while it's great, if it's the same people coming out to oppose this particular development, you think? And <laughs> when you have village or town elected positions that are only two years at best, people remember, and they go out and vote you out if you for any reason, want to support a particular development that may have affordable housing for families, right? So, so it's also that political Blanca will. Blanca hit the nail on yep. the head with respect to that. So projects take longer than election cycles. Yep. That's the problem. That's, yep. So mm -hmm. I spend my time convincing my elected officials that this is a good thing for these reasons. The next guy comes in and it's, we have to start from all over, from scratch, or he's in because he disagreed with the prior. So, so let's talk to Jenny for a second, because she and I chatted briefly at the beginning. She's looking at all of us going, you have so many municipalities in Westchester County. You got these towns, and you got these villages, and you've got these cities, and you don't have large regional planning institutions. So are we doomed to just bang our heads against the wall three nights a week in a different community? Or is there a way that we can turn to to someone, is it, is it state legislative action? We have home rule, as Michael alluded to, which is a good thing, but it's really frustrating to many. How do we deal with this? Having lots of small places makes it harder, um, and that does make it more useful to have either some regional authority or probably state level is more likely, right? So that's, that's exactly what the role of the state can do, is to say, all right, you, you guys all get to develop your own comprehensive plan, right? The bigger places can have neighborhood-specific plan. But at the end of the day, every single community has a target to hit. You figure out how to get there, but you need to do this. And I will say that one thing on the, on the politics side that's really important, so community meetings bring out people who want to say no, and they want to push back, and they want to complain about everything and stop things. The way to counter that is to have an organized group of people who show up and say, yes, we want this. We would benefit from it. Our neighbors would benefit from it. So you know, one of the reasons why I have some hope <laughs> that we're gonna get to the other side of this, at, at least in some places, is that there's a lot more organized yeah. support for more housing than we've ever seen before, right? So if you've heard the term YIMBY, yes in my backyard, right? That's the opposite of NIMBY. Um, there's more and more organization at the local level and in some places like California at the state level to show up and tell elected officials, actually, this is great. Build some more apartments. More apartments means we can support more neighborhood-serving retail. More apartments means people who don't live here yet can move in. And by the way, for elected officials, they're paying attention to people who live in the community already. But you know what? If you build a whole bunch of apartments, there are a bunch of people who are going to move in, and they're going to be really excited that they got to live there. Right? Convincing elected officials that there is support for change is really crucial to getting to them to vote for this. Right? And that can happen at the project level, that can happen at the election level. Open New York is your regional group uh, that's organizing to push more housing. But getting people who show up and go from town to town and say, yeah, this is great, this is fantastic, this is the region we want, that helps a lot. Before you go back to DC, please leave us the name and number of where we find these people. To Dr. Schutz's and it, point. And it's, oh, sorry. No, no, it's okay. Just in terms of, of including who, who talks about affordable housing or housing in general and to kind of clarify any myths that are there with, mm -hmm. with regards to development, right? It used to be a conversation just between either the county and the municipality during our settlement years, HUD, the county, and the municipality. But now we see campaigns brewing from, like for example, the Welcome Home campaign that Tim Foley and BRI, and I know the WCA is a part of, you know, they have done so much work in terms of putting this conversation out front. For people to go to their website and see, oh, well, 
you know, the develop, uh, an opponent, opponent of this particular development is saying that it's going to bring 100 kids into the school district. Well, you look it up. And what are the actual facts with respect to new development and the number of school children that it could bring potentially? So I think the conversation has expanded, and that's what we need to do. It shouldn't just be a government discussion, but it should really be a countywide discussion from all the stakeholders, economic, religious, um, planning, everybody, municipalities, everybody involved, and just people in general who can, you know, uh, benefit from these developments. So and, and people, I mean, this is, I mean, the Yimby thing is amazing. It's truly organic, I swear. Um, it's become organic. And I think the sh kind of the fun, dirty, wish it weren't a secret is that people like planning. People like, pl like, my introduction to Westchester as a, as a young developer was uh, in New Rochelle in a, the hard, toughest, meanest, dragged down, you know, by yard signs across the city, stop my project. Um, and it was an amazing learning experience as a young developer that didn't really have much at stake, except for many evenings not drinking because I was sitting in planning board meetings. But um, it was horrible. I mean, politics, elections wrapped into it, terrible, terrible, terrible. And now, I mean, it wasn't just less than five years later that the city visioned this plan. They, you know, involved the public. They said, this is what we're going to do. Here are the impacts. Here are the limitations. They got people to buy in. They set the plan. And then, you know, they implemented it amazingly, right? I mean, that's, and people, not everybody's, oh, you know, you're never going to please all the people all the what time. What happens with off-site infrastructure? You don't Jonathan, have those politics. When they turn back to you, and you can feel free to elbow and uh, Blanca on this if you need to, what happens when you get hit for off-site infrastructure? Is that going to defeat your ability to generate the project or generate the affordable units? Do you need help from the county or some other? Source? Yeah, I mean, there's a limit. It, it goes back to tell me the rules up front, right? It, publish it. Make it clear, right? What are the fees? Like, it's the first thing we're looking at. What's going to cost? What are the taxes? What are the fees? What's going to cost to get through? Um, so, so I just want to yeah, please. So an interesting anecdote. So I represent some communities that have not adopted the model ordinance. Mm -hmm. Developers will come to the community and say, I'd like to build something. Let's have our pre-meeting. We have the meeting. What's it going to you know, Do you have a recreation fee? What's involved? And what's your affordable housing requirement? There is none. What do you mean there isn't one? There isn't one. We don't have a rule. But I'm going to do it. You know, that's what we have to do. So I'm going to do it anyway. So it's not as though, um, and, and what that means is it's built into the, to Jonathan's pro forma. It's an expectation. Right. It's part of the, the, the penciling out of the, of the project at the end of the day. And it either works or it doesn't work. But it's not an unexpected element in this area. It's, it's a normal thing to do. Um, the one thing that I would say about this, uh, this silo of affordable housing is we don't have to address it only as affordable housing. So when we attack the issue from providing housing for our seniors, for example, like just think of the baby boom generation. Like we are the most important cohort that's ever existed in this country. We are all graying out of our homes. We're looking Every at Every boomer says so, just ask them. Exactly right. <laughs> In term, uh, you just mentioned, and here's a plug for New York City, uh, they have a, a wonderful regional planning department that produces mm -hmm. excellent demographic information. They're terrific. A number I saw this morning was 1.1 overhoused, 1.1 million overhoused people right now. That means too much house, they want to get out. 1.1 million people in the region looking to downsize, and we haven't built enough for them by diversifying, diversifying the housing stock, building different types of, of price points those people have some place to go. And by the way, we're addressing affordability at the same time by doing that. So uh, two things. One, it's one of the questions, it's one of the reasons why I asked the question, is anybody here in age-restricted housing? Because we have such a dearth of age-restricted housing in Westchester County where people have that, where people would have that option to move on. But l l let, let's use that as a jumping off point, and this will be my last topic, and then we can open up to the audience. Um, Aging seniors, senior housing, let's go straight to assisted living. And this question is really for Jenny or Blanca, maybe both of you. Should we, as a society, as, a, as, a, as government, as developers, be providing affordable assisted living? Is, to the extent that we are having a conference talking about affordable housing, and we know developers in many places are expected to provide affordable housing, are developers expected to provide affordable assisted living? So this is another one that we can, the, the fundamental need 
older households who are going to need slightly different houses, smaller houses, accessible houses, and that some of them will also need supportive services. Those are things that we can meet in a couple of different ways. Uh, doing the housing and the services in a purpose-built community is expensive, right? The housing itself is expensive to build, the services are expensive. The housing subsidies that you can tap into for capitally affordable housing do not fit with the sources that you can tap into for healthcare, for services. Um, so it, it's an expensive one to do. Affordable, capitally affordable assisted living is really, really complicated and really difficult to do, even more so than just straight affordable housing. But the combinations of things, right? Letting people age in place, using, say, Medicaid vouchers to pay for some home health care aides to come in, you know, visiting nursing services, tapping into services that already exist in the community, tying them into naturally occurring retirement communities, places that have a lot of older adults, right? Those are some cheaper ways to do this, right? Mm -hmm. New York City is actually a great example. They're whole buildings that are basically naturally occurring retirement communities where lots of old people live in the apartments they've lived in for a long time. You bring in visiting nurses, you bring in Meals on Wheels, you've basically got assisted living, but you don't call it that, and it's a cheaper model to do. Blanca, do you agree? What's your perspective? It's, from it's, the county. It's a it's, tough issue, I know. It is a tough issue. It's very expensive. I mean, I agree with Dr. Schutz. Seniors want to age in place. I think about 16% of the county's population is 65 or over. And I think the 85 and over cohort are the greatest, there has been a greatest increase in the last couple of years. So there is a need for it. However, when developers propose also senior housing, for example, mm -hmm no impact to the school district, very smaller units, parking, you know, you may need one spot for per unit, et cetera. But if the developer is looking for tax credits at the state level, the state level is now saying you have to wait your turn. You're doing too many senior housing in Westchester County, perhaps we'll look at your proposal next year. Mm -hmm. So what happens then, right? Now, when you're talking about assisted living, how, where will the people who work in these assisted living facilities live? Good question. So we have to make sure that we're also building housing for them because the information that we have and the data we have, for example, for home health care workers, they're traveling from the Bronx, they're traveling from the north and part um, yeah. Dutchess, Putnam, to come and work into Westchester County because they cannot find a place to live here. Great, great answer. By the way, David, I just want to put in a plug for the county association. So the comment that Jenny made about you should have people speaking in favor of projects, a week ago, we were at, a, at a, a public hearing for a project, fairly controversial, mostly NIMBY naysayers who were uninformed. Michael showed up and said, by the way, there's a, there's a different perspective here. Let me say why this is a good thing. The rest of the room didn't stand up to finish commenting because they heard a logical argument that, oh, there's a, there is an upside to these things. I don't have to stand up and, and say something silly anymore. Great so the, the ability to counteract that is, I think, really, really important. And the County Association, I think, is a wonderful forum for Absolutely. physically doing that. Michael is proof of the pudding. Michael, I could not figure out why you put him on the panel. <laughs> now I understand. <laughs> Questions from the audience? Anybody? Oh, I'm sorry. Your mic is coming up behind you, Emily. Oh, Dr. Schutz, I'm curious if you think that some of this is a misunderstanding of affordable housing. At the county, we have tried through videos and other things to demystify affordable housing. Because I think in some instances, people envision like those buildings that they bombed in Chicago that were so horrible. And it's actually not the case. And what frustrates me is in the community where I live, so many homes have been torn down and what has gone up in their place is the size of a multi-family building. Somebody in my neighborhood, tear down after tear down and then something that's six, 8,000 square feet for one family, to your point about the environment and people in Westchester who claim to care about the environment, that is not an environmentally sustainable thing. So I wonder, and again, we're all crediting the Westchester County Association and BRI for this Welcome Home Westchester effort because it's so unique. But if you feel that in the communities that have had success, did they demystify what affordable housing was? That can certainly help. Um, I mean, nimbyism comes from a lot of places. Some of it is, particularly with the capitally affordable housing, people think public housing 
1950s high rises. Um, and you know, tax credit properties that get built look exactly like market rate apartments, right? It's the same materials, it's the same design. You can't tell the difference, right? So some of this is reassuring people that they're gonna be physically attractive, they fit into the neighborhood, they can be done in lots of architectural styles that look like properties surrounding them. There's a real fear of what density means, right? So, you know, I, I live in a city that is townhouses. You can get a lot of townhouses on an acre of land, and it's, you know, it's adorable. It's like, you know, Brownstone, Brooklyn. You can build that all day long and get a lot more people than single-family homes on two-acre lots, and it still feels like a walkable neighborhood, and it's not scary, right? So the push for, you know, what we call either missing middle or gentle density, that can work in a lot of places, particularly in suburban communities, and it doesn't look scary when you show people it's here, right? All of your older communities have those housing types. Those are some of the charming Main Streets areas where people walk and would love to live. That's what we're talking about legalizing. The harder stuff to combat is people use aesthetics to push back when they really don't like the people who are gonna live in these homes, right? There is an enormous social stigma against renting, right? I mean, the idea that renters aren't gonna take care of the property, they don't put down roots in the community, they're not really like real neighbors, right? Living next door to an investor-owned property where renters live in it, this is somehow bad. You know, renters are people too. <laughs> they want the same things in their neighborhoods that owners do, right? Renters come in all ages, in all family types, in all shapes and sizes, and all incomes. Renters are people too, but somehow there's this deep-seated fear that a renter majority neighborhood is going to be a less nice place to live, right? And this is just opening the doors to, you know, the end of civilization. And I think to your point, Dr. Sh I'm sorry, uh -huh. how many renters are actually elected officials? How many renters sit in planning boards? How many renters sit in zoning boards? And how many renters actually come out and opine on a development being proposed? Fair point. Would, would another, another question? Yeah. Could, Somebody in the back? I, I, I have one here. My, my name is Ray Hollingsworth. I'm a director of the Hudson Gateway Association of Realtors. We fought to make co-op transparency law in Westchester County. That battle had been raging for about 25 years. And I noticed that nobody talked about race. But clearly to me that that was a, a problem with race and ethnicity. And I'm listening to you describe the problem of affordable housing, but nobody's talking about race. And so my question is, does it serve, do you think, or do you agree with me, that race or ethnicity is part of the reason why there's the political pushback and some of these projects aren't getting done, and does it serve us to talk about it in that framework? Yes. I mean, race is absolutely part of it. The social stigma against renting is partly about race, it's partly a cl class, it's partly about age, but absolutely, the pushback against density, against affordable housing is absolutely in part about race. Yeah, what you hear the euphemism, it, it's out of character of our community. Character is the, is the, is the, the you know, the, the disguise um, to say it's about, you know, it's, it's, it's really racially oriented. It's not in the character of our community. So that's an interesting, it's an interesting issue, Ray, that you raise because I think in, a, in response to that, again, planners tend to be socially conscious. So there's a way of dealing with zoning. I talked about the hard line of zoning before in that something called form-based zoning was a way to deal with character. So we're going to create this new type of zoning that's about form-based zoning that will address the real character issue of your community, not the underlying character issue of your community. Drive around Westchester right now. And I see lawn signs that say, stop the form-based code. Mm -hmm. First off, how cool is that, of planning things on people's lawn signs? <laughs> but but, it, but it's, it's not about that. It's about the other issues of density and so forth. But even trying to attack the issue, it's an intractable issue. I don't know how you answer that. It's, you know, we, it's, you know, it's, an, it's an enormously complex issue. Can Jenny honest. just follow up on that? In your experience nationally, <laughs> are form-based codes better mechanisms of generating density, workforce housing, and affordable housing, or is that a, mis is that a misconception? The places that adopt form-based codes are the places that want to build more housing. So whether they adopt form-based code or traditional code, they're places where you can build. The places that really don't want more density and don't want more housing aren't gonna adopt a form-based code, and if you put one on there, they're still gonna fight it. Any other question? Somebody in the back has got a mic. Yes, yes, hi. So I want to ask about, uh, first of all, I want to say thank you for the kind words about the Welcome Home Westchester campaign from some of the panelists. We're, we're trying our darndest, but it's an uphill fight. Um, 
I want to talk about some of the underutilized tools that exist that some communities are using, but they have not caught on. One of them, we know that the Westchester County Model Affordability Ordinance, only about 19 to 21, depending on how you count, communities even adopted any version of it. Many of them did not adopt some of the versions that would actually help get to some of Jonathan's points about the timeline, pre-application conferences, setting out a timeline for review, that sort of thing. That's only in three or four municipalities. How do we get municipalities to take a second look at what they already have on the books and possibly expand it? And then the second thing that's being used in some community is school impact fees. I happen to think it's, it's not the best idea in the world because anytime you add additional fees onto the development, you're increasing the cost, you're pushing some level of affordability out of reach. On the other hand, it does politically diffuse the question about school impact. So if the school impact exceeds something from the Rutgers study or something like that, the developer will be paying some fees to offset it and it mutes some of the opposition as a direct result. How do we get those uh, tools or others to be more broadly adopted? So I'll just answer that briefly. I'm sorry, no, Matt. Okay. So, um, Poking, you, you've poked the bear, talking about school impacts. That is perhaps the most misunderstood element of our land use review and approval process. The, the PTA will come out and say that project that is changing the character of our community is going to impact our schools. We, as planners, deliver school impact studies that show, in fact, there'll be a half a kid generated from that project, or maybe two, or something like that. And they're saying, no, 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 there'll be 150 kids. That's it. So by Yes, an impact fee associated with that sort of politically deflects that. But I think if you're, you're, you're jumping into such a volatile argument to begin with by using that as the basis to, to solve the problem, I fear um, that that may be just a, a Pandora's box of issues associated with it. So I, schools always worry me, and the facts don't matter with respect to school impact issues. So that, I, that worries me a bit. I mean, the model ordinance is, we've read it and we talked about it in preparation, and you know, I think there's a lot to like there. You, you need projects to apply it to, like you need supply to apply it to for it to do anything. And it, there's just, I mean, Secret, like we just, outside of New York City, we don't believe in property rights in this state, basically. I mean, right, there's no such thing as as of right. You can have a form-based code, you can have a comprehensive plan. There is no, you, there is no the as developer, right. can you tell that? <laughs> so I, again, I go back to my example of the night of a form-based code, a comprehensive plan, lots of public examples, lots of fees clearly laid out, and a planning commission that has just said, we're five people who do not agree with this and we are not gonna move it forward. And there's really no practical remedy. I mean, your, one of your colleagues said, you know, just this morning said, there's no such thing as as of right in Westchester County, and it's true. Um, so it just, until you have some, you know, I guess shame on me for believing what was on paper, but, um, you know, I guess my answer is I won't do another, um, I want to do this project, I won't do another one in that community for the foreseeable future, and it just narrows the opportunity to where uh, the investment dollar is going to go to to try to make projects happen, to try to make good um, communities happen. and. Maybe as it gets a little nuanced, but like I think the piece that people also miss out on is like it is a competitive marketplace. So in a New Rochelle, in a Yonkers, in a White Plains, where developers are now forced to compete against each other because there's actual options, you get this virtuous cycle of like better and better supply, better and better communities. And, and Jonathan, you know, think about what you're saying. Things. It's frustrating if you've got, you're, you're saying, it's frustrating if you've got something that's as of right comp plan says you should do it, and you're ready, you're ready, you got the money, you're ready to do it. Think about, because we're in Westchester County, it's, it's a county that's turning over, things are changing. We have golf courses being repurposed, we have office buildings in downtown White Plains that are being repurposed, it's happening all throughout our county. That requires somebody to have the vision to say, I want to rezone something. And then the minute you step, you're, you're in the world of as of right, what about the world of of rezoning. Well, you're and, that's really what, and that's where folks like Pat, I mean, look, Harrison is a community that said, let's think about the Miracle Mile. New Rochelle is a community. Yonkers is a community. A lot of, uh, Mount Vernon is a community that said, let's think about sections of our city and lay it out. And it, and that is amazing because it depoliticizes it. It depersonalizes it. It's not about NRP. It's about the vision that the town set out. And that's great. 
you just, you gotta be a New Rochelle, you gotta be a White Plains, you gotta be a Yonkers, where you actually, a Harrison, where you actually say, this is our plan, we're gonna proactively, you know, change the code, change the zoning, and then implement it. Got it. Last question, because Michael wants us to wrap up and the five of us can just stick around for the next three hours and keep going. <coughs> Why are developers asked to provide affordable product, but the dry cleaner is not asked to do that, the hardware stores are not asked to do that, the movie theaters are not asked to do that. I'm gonna answer my own question with a, with a common retort when I have this debate. But David, that's because housing is essential. It, it's, it's necessary, that, that's gotta be why. My answer to that is, so is ice cream in the summertime and when I go to Longford's in Rye and they have amazing ice cream, there's no affordable ice cream program. So why is it that we're here talking about developers having to provide this? Nobody wants that. It, that's, <laughs> uh, you know, a, a trite answer to that, David, is housing is a, a, a human right. It's, it, ice cream, would, it's a nice thing to have, but it, housing is a human right. It's housing, shelter. That's, I think, a different level of, obliga of social obligation than the, than the other things that are nice to have. Jonathan? <laughs> I can go if you want. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let him off the hook, Blanca. You know, it's, it's, with respect to the role of government, I mean, we see that there's a need. We see that there are households that are um, paying more than 50% of their monthly income towards rent. We see that there are households living in substandard conditions. We see that there are households living in overcrowded conditions. And I think the role of government is to step in and work with the stakeholders that are involved. And the goal would be for people to have a decent place to live. And I think that is what we strive to do, whether it's through funding through our capital projects um, program, whether it's funding our nonprofits for rental assistance, whether it's looking at acquiring property, whether it's um, uh, hotels, motels for adaptive reuse uh, purposes. So we, we're trying many different tools in our toolbox, um, and we bring along our 46 municipalities so that we can talk to them and explain to them the need to build housing, but with a focus on affordable housing. It, the, the medium length answer is you know, two part. One is that we live in a part of the country where we've said we prioritize this. This is part of our values, and that's fine. I, I'm, I'm proud of that. I'm rewarded by having that be a part of, uh, you know, when we're not doing, you know, capital A affordable, having that be a part of our projects. And it just comes with, you know, what are the rules of the road? Tell me up front, you know, pilot programs, et cetera. Be, you know, lay it out for me, and I'll fit the box. The irony or the lack of irony or lack of awareness of irony is with, you know, is the communities that torture you for three years, you know, say, well, you can't build 200 units, you have to build 180 units and you got to do it and we got to go through 10 public hearings and, you know, and then at the end of the day, it's like, oh, but you got to provide 10% affordable housing. You know, it's like, well, <laughs> you just held up, you just cut the project down, you helped me up three years, but, but, but like, you know, there's no sense of the cause and effect there. So if you really, it, the best way to provide affordable housing is to provide all housing, and then, you know, you can target it and segment it and do all these things, but um, that's, that's just a, the flip isn't, side of it I have to raise. That, that that's the message from everyone, in, the solution will come from everyone in this room, there's no doubt about it, and the message is we have a housing crisis that consists of an affordable crisis, consists of a senior crisis, consists of an entry level crisis. Yep all of it combined, and if you as the Pied Pipers go back to your constituents and your colleagues and reinforce the fact that, that, high, that is, there is a housing crisis and hammer that home, eventually we'll figure that out and build it into our comprehensive plan and our approach to government. I, I, I'm sorry, if I could just chime in. Another thing with respect to a crisis is our old housing stock. 81% of our housing units were built uh, 1979 or before then. You know, what are we doing with respect to making sure that these um, houses that are probably being um, uh, occupied by people who are paying, or maybe 30% of their monthly income is going towards, towards that housing cost, we want to make sure to keep those properties affordable. So how do we do that if we're not providing incentives for property improvement or rehab or any of those types of, of programs that may be available? You guys were terrific, and as I said at the outset, I, 
Well, I didn't think we were really going to solve the dilemma. At least we can begin to address the dilemma. I think having open discussions like this with, with this kind of group and this kind of expertise is, is really a good start. And, I, and I, uh, I hope this was beneficial to everyone. Michael, I hope we hit what you were looking for. So now I know what to get David next time he gets uh, uh, an approval. We'll get, we'll get him a fudgy the whale or a, a cookie puss. <laughs> Um, let's get this, thank you for putting the sponsor slide back up while I, while I finish up. Um, so to the folks who serve on local planning boards, and, and I talk to a lot of them, in many cases, they want some political cover. They know this is a problem, but they're concerned about facing down their constituency. Um, we need people to invest in Westchester. This is not just about affordable housing, it's about housing in general. Uh, yet, when we talk to the folks who serve in the state legislature, they all nod and say, yes, we understand this is a big problem, but we saw what happened this year when we had TOD legislation and ADU legislation, which was at least introduced by the governor, and didn't get any traction at the legislature level. Uh, there was a major pushback from local community groups. Ironically, these same people who, when they vote their values, they want things like racial desegregation. They want opportunities for the middle class. They want a clean environment. But they don't want what it means building in their own backyard, as long as it's done someplace else. These are the issues that are tailor-made for state-level solutions. So you know, what can we do? Okay, so we can pressure our state lawmakers to do something about it. In no, Jenny will tell you, in no state where these laws were passed that it happened in the first year. It takes sustained effort over many years. Okay. The other thing we can do is, the WCA will join with the other communities, the other business associations and councils to band together to put pressure on our state legislatures to do something about it. You know, George came out uh, when those bills were, were floated. Frankly, I don't think that his uh, perspective was a strong enough voice on behalf of solving some of these needs. Uh, but at least he came out and made a statement about it and we'll kind of pick up from there. So I want to thank our incredible uh, panel again, our incredible keynote. David, thank you for moderating. Thanks again to our sponsors. I need to call out my staff, Melissa, Aurora, Kathy, Jason, and Amy for helping us put this on today. Um, and just a couple of quick liner notes. We have some upcoming events. We have some spring networking coming up where you get an opportunity to meet other members of our board. That's on June 15th at Whitby Castle and Rye. Uh, Amy is putting on an all-access healthcare innovation series on June 21st at the CV Rich Mansion. And then on July 14th at Pace Law School, the region's first ever sustainable business conference that we're putting on at the WCA. The next event that we have coming up starts right now out on the patio. Please enjoy some food and cocktails with us, and thanks for coming. <laughs>